This episode is brought to you by the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation and its Montana-based AMB West Philanthropies, both of which embody the value-based approach to philanthropy and business of their chairman, Arthur M. Blank. The foundation is doing excellent and impactful work in Montana and beyond, so I encourage you to check out their website at blankfoundation.org to learn more. Thanks a lot. Hey, this is Ed Robertson, and this is the Mountain and Prairie Podcast, where I introduce you to some of the innovative individuals who are shaping the future of the American West. I meet most of these people through my work in land conservation or through my hobbies and interests that revolve around spending time up high in the mountains. My guests include ranchers, writers, entrepreneurs, conservationists, athletes, artists, adventurers, pretty much anyone who's doing important work, has an interesting story, and loves the American West. My guest today is Shane Doyle. Shane is a Montana-based scholar, teacher, and community advocate whose work focuses on the history and heritage of Native American tribes of the Northern Great Plains. Shane is an enrolled member of the Absaliga Nation, which is also known as the Crow Tribe, and he holds a doctorate in curriculum and instruction from Montana State University. His unique personal and professional experiences, combined with his deep curiosity and seemingly endless energy, have made Shane a well-known leader in many fields, including education, land use advocacy, and the arts. Shane grew up in Crow Agency, Montana, and he didn't have an interest in history until college when a road trip with a professor opened his eyes to Montana's rich Native American past. From that moment forward, Shane's curiosity has continued to grow, and he's built his career around making Native American history a cultural mainstay in everything from Montana's educational system to its governmental land management decisions. Whether he's designing educational curriculums, making films, or singing Northern Plains tribal music, Shane is always focused on serving his community. Whether you're a longtime listener or this is your first episode, I know you'll enjoy getting to know Shane. We started out discussing his youth on the Crow Reservation, and he talks about that fateful road trip where he fell in love with history. We talk about his family and the important life lessons that he learned from his grandmother. We talk about the history of the Saliga Nation and the importance of the Crazy Mountains from a cultural and historical perspective. We also talk about his consulting business, Native Nexus, some of his film projects, and his plans for the future. And Shane obviously has lots of excellent book recommendations, so be sure to check out the episode notes for links to all those. As you'll hear in this conversation, Shane is doing so much excellent work and has so many more projects in the pipeline. I'll look forward to a part two with Shane in the future so we can hear updates on everything that he's working on. Hope you enjoy. You know, given your your background and everything you've done up there and your connection to Montana, I was thinking maybe the the best place we could just start is at the beginning and you could talk a little Mm -hmm. bit about where where you grew up. So where did you grow up? Yeah, I grew up on the, uh, well, first of all, let me say thank you so much, Ed, for inviting me on and um, you know, being such a generous host and it's really nice to be able to talk with you and I'm very uh, thankful for the opportunity. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I grew up on the Crow Indian reservation, uh, in a small town uh, Crow agency it's called. Okay. And, uh, it was called, it was named Crow agency because that was where the site of the, that's where the Indian agent lived originally, uh, when they moved there back in 1884. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's right along the banks of the Little Bighorn River, and it's about a mile from the site of the famous Little Bighorn Battle. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, later on as a teenager, my mom moved uh, with my stepdad. They they actually lived there on the battlefield itself for the past thirty years. Wow! So uh, yeah, yep. And his mom had lived there for much longer, um, and uh, my stepdad and he's got brothers and sisters that have homes out there as well so uh it's an interesting place with a lot of amazing history there and i never really knew much about it growing up you know uh funny to say they don't really teach too much of it in schools and you know unless you really seek it out and ask local historians yeah um you know it's you don't really learn a lot sometimes about the place where you grow up but yeah that's where i'm from and so do you remember a certain point in your childhood or maybe even like early teens when you 
when you did kind of realize the history of the land that you were on and, and kind of what you were missing um, because they weren't teaching it in schools and that kind of thing? I mean, was there a was there a moment when you because it's you know, it seems like a lot of your your professional life now is you know, history and teaching this part of history that has been ignored for so long. So, I mean, what was, was there a specific point or was it more of kind of like a slow burn where you're like, wait a minute, I'm missing over half the story here. God, that's such a great question. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that. Um, and it's so important too. you know, there was a pivotal moment, I think, and it happened actually when I was an undergraduate, um, you know, I had been studying to become a teacher at, here at Montana State University in Bozeman, and I had made friends with uh, all my Native American studies professors, actually. And uh, one of them, we got to be really close. And uh, one summer, him and I and his girlfriend, we took a trip. We drove up to uh, Flathead Lake, um, yep. where his sister lived, Yep, and get some cherries. It was, you know, late in July. And uh, actually, I think it was in August. And... Uh, get some, I don't know if there was any huckleberries left at that time. I think they did have some for us, but, um, all along the way, he kept on every, every place we'd go, he'd say, Hey Shane, you know, that's where the treaty was signed or, you know, that's where this famous battle was, or, you know, uh, just pointing out different sites and, oh man, I just, I loved it, you know? And I thought, I don't know where this guy learned all this stuff, but, um, it's sure fun to travel with him because, he just brings the landscape alive. And, you know, as a native person growing up here in Montana, I think there's always been a part of me that's always wondered about what it used to be like, you know, mm-hmm. a long time ago. But there was never, I don't think there was ever much of a passionate interest with within my, you know, friends, within my community. And so I never really um, became all that interested until that one trip, I think, really, I decided at that point that I wanted to be like him. Oh, wow. I wanted to know. Yeah. So I want to be like that. I want to be that guy that can tell people, you know, this is what happened here. And, you know, um, go into more detail about who the people were that did those things and why they were here and what became of that episode of history. And, you know, it was such a um, fun way to to experience a place, you know. Mm-hmm. And so and I think I had, like I said, always had some interest, but. I think it from that point on, it became a point to me to to read more books about Montana history, to gather as much information as I could about the place where I lived. And so, was it was it kind of a, a process of really learning kind of a large, like kind of a wide spectrum of Native American history in the West, or did you did you decide pretty early that you wanted to focus pretty you know pretty closely on on the crow tribe i mean how how did how did that go i mean how did you decide kind of what you wanted to really zone in on you know um as i was saying growing up on the crow indian reservation you're kind of immersed within your own uh you know culture Mm -hmm. and so you don't really get a chance to see or learn about the other tribes of the area unless you have some kind of a way to do that um and one of the best ways to do that is to engage in like uh, cultural activities. So I'm a singer of Plains Indian style music. And I started singing, uh, you know, as a teenager. And uh, that opened up a whole new world for me to understand and learn more about the tribes around the region. And because we all share the same style of music. And so I kind of used that venue there of singing and, um, you know, music and dance to engage with other, you know, people from throughout Montana. I learned a lot over the years singing with Blackfeet and uh, Cheyenne and Lakota, Mm -hmm. Salish and Kootenai. And um, so, yeah, I think not that I purposefully set out to study those groups, but just singing with them. And then as a researcher later on, uh, you know, asking questions maybe um, from time to time, not like an ethnographer, you know, with peppering people with questions all the time, but just if something came up that was real curious to me, you know, I would ask my friends about it. And, um, you know, uh, that was another opportunity or a way for me to learn about the communities and uh, the different tribal cultures. 
So for people, you know, I know that pretty much everybody who listens to this podcast is familiar with the crow, but they may not know very, you know, the specifics of, of where their land, you know, where their historic lands were and then where the reservations were and then how that land through broken treaties was taken away and it's shrunken down to just this, this very small percentage of what it used to be. And the film you made, I thought did such a great job of, um, mm. of explaining that. And I, you know, I didn't even know that. And I, I feel like I'm pretty engaged in trying to learn and it was very helpful for me to mm-hmm. see that from that film. So I appreciate that. But could you just mm-hmm. give give kind of a brief overview of the crow and, and the, of their, the landscape, um, that they inhabit and, and just kind of a, a brief, I guess, biography of the, of the crow. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, well, first of all, you know, we're known as the crow, but we quit using that name some years ago. Uh, although we still use it from time, time to time, just in, uh, you know, visiting with folks. Uh, but officially our name is Apsaloga. And so we're the Apsaloga nation. And uh, so we were given the term crow, the name crow, by, uh, you know, fur trappers and traders that came into the region and mm-hmm. somehow misinterpreted our actual name. The name or the word of uh refers to um, descendants of the large beaked bird. And so that's what it means. It means children of the large beaked bird. So we're not sure what that bird is. There's been a lot of historians who have, have had different um, you know, hypothesis about what that bird was. Maybe it's not even around anymore. Some people have said that, um, but it wasn't a crow. And so, but we use crow again, like I said, because it's convenient. And sure. because when you say Upsalaga, a lot of people don't know what you're talking about. So, uh-huh. um, so we came to Montana. We have a migration story that brought us to Montana um, about 500 years ago. And we came following the, a vision, a dream that a man had to to come to the Rocky Mountains, really. And he saw twinkling uh, stars on the mountain, and it was a plant, uh, a short, what they call a short tobacco plant. And so we came following his dream, and when he saw that mountain, which he, most historians say is the Bighorn Range, that's where we stopped. And so we started living in the Bighorn, Upper Yellowstone region, you know, probably about 500, 600 years ago, hard to say. And we just occupied the area all the way to the south of the Bighorn Range in uh, central Wyoming, or yeah, central Wyoming, all the way up into central Montana, the Muscle Shell, and even up onto the Missouri, mm-hmm. over to the uh, Black Hills in South Dakota, and then as far west as the uh, Three Forks headwaters of the Missouri River. So an area of probably about between 40 to 50 million acres that we roamed on <clears throat> and uh, called our homeland for the past 500 years or so. And then when the treaties were signed, the first treaty in 1851 at Fort Laramie, that was signed because of the California gold rush. And so at that time, there was no desire on the government's part to acquire any land in Montana. And so the whole state in that first treaty was divided up into reservations, really. Mm -hmm. And the only place that wasn't a specific reservation was here at the Gallatin Valley around Bozeman and this area. And that was considered to be an intertribal hunting ground. So um, that was the first treaty. And then the second treaty was signed because of the gold rush to Virginia City. And that was in 1867-68. And that one there was when the reservations began to become diminished significantly. So the Crow Reservation went from 30 million acres down to 12. Wow. And then, uh, yeah, yep. And then uh, from 12 down to eight, and then from eight down to six, and then eventually to 2.3, where we're at now. When I hear that, you know, obviously I'm completely removed from it and and it's not my people but when i hear that it my first probably is and it's probably not a very sophisticated uh emotion but it's just like anger <laughs> and so <laughs> h- how do you 
I mean, what, how do you go about, how do you think about that? I mean, how do you, um, kind of square that in your mind and, and not, and, and have, and not be just furious about it all the time? I mean, I think maybe the answer is that being furious is a waste of time, which I, I need to learn myself. But I mean, what, I mean, how do you, how do you think about that in your mind? No, that's such a great question. Um, you know, I'm not sure if I've ever given it too much uh, consideration. You're too busy um, doing productive things and not being angry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you kind of take cues from your elders, right? Mm -hmm. You watch them. Um, and you know, this, you certainly don't listen to them that no young people have ever listened to elders. <laughs> um, but you never fail to act like them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you can't escape from behaving just like them in the end. And, uh, you know, I learned so much from my grandmother. I was very close to her. She was probably the biggest influence in my life. My mother, of course, was very important. She was a single parent growing up. Um, but my grandmother uh, played a huge role. And she was taken away from her parents when she was seven years old and sent to a boarding school. Wow. Um, you know, basically taken from her mother's arms. It's a horrible story. Mm. And, uh, you know, she spent the next you know, 11 years away from her parents. She never saw her mother again. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And so that was the life that she lived. You know, her and her six brothers and sisters got sent to Haskell on the train. Uh, when they came back in 1930, it was really the start of the Great Depression, you know, and they were at the bottom of the social economic ladder, Indian women. Mm hmm in the Great Depression on a reservation in Montana. I mean, you couldn't imagine getting too much worse, right? Yeah. Uh and then, you know, my grandfather, he struggled in life with alcohol and, um, you know, finding his place in this world. And so my grandmother had to bear the brunt. She had 10 children, um, you know, raised all of them and uh, just really was a role model for me. She wasn't uh, she wasn't an angry person. She was happy. You know, she laughed a lot. She laughed every day. She loved her family. She loved her life. She was hardcore when it came to fighting for things. Really? And I think that's where I learned to be, be that way. You know, um, you know, if you hold your ground, you're going to hold your ground till you die. That was her thing. You know, I mean, this is it. Once you, once you decide this is the way I'm going to be or this is the way things are going to be, then that's the way it is. And um, I think I just, you know, learned not to be a bitter person from her. Um I understand, you know, that there's been a lot of transgressions in history, but um, I don't think that has anything to do with me. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I just inherited all this. And uh, and the ceremonial way that was shown to me by my elders back home has always been like so wonderful and freeing. You know, um, you know, after the sweat lodge or sweat uh, or a fast or a sun dance or even a smudge ceremony, you know, you're reborn, you're fresh and new. You know, there's no more worries or, uh, you know, um, depression and, or whatever ails you. Um, you can just be happy and clean and pure again. And so those are the values that I've tried to hang on to. I want to talk about those ceremonies and the, the, kind of the cleansing, whether it's the fasting or sweat lodge, because I'm super interested in that. But but real quick before that, you know, obviously you're you're driven. You had the you know great role model in your grandmother who was extremely tough. But where did the where did the service component come from? Because I feel like when I look at your resume and, and, you know, you type your name into Google and it's just this unbelievable list of all this great stuff you're working on, but it seems that there is this kind of the common thread is that everything you're doing seems to be of service. You know, your, your historical research is of service to people so they can under, better understand the place. And, um, it, it, you know, and you could have, you could have taken a different turn, which would have been great as well. But I mean, you could have, gone to New York and been an investment banker or something. So, so, I mean, so why, wh where did this, uh, I don't know if you call it a need or a want or desire to, to serve come from? Yeah, you know, I've always loved people. Yeah. Um, ever, ever since I was a kid, I've been amazed by them. I've just been, you know, uh, obsessed with culture, pop culture. And then as I grew older, uh, ancient cultures from around the world and, um, 
what is the human condition? You know, what is this thing that we all have in common? And um, why is that important to understand that? And how can we perceive that? And those are the kinds of questions that I think I've, I've always had. And, um, you know, learning about Plains Indian culture and Plains Indian people and seeing how wonderful they are uh, and how good I've been treated all over uh, the state by different tribes and throughout the nation. And I just, I really uh, want to share that knowledge and that culture with everyone because I think not enough people understand and realize uh, the significant contribution that Native people have made to our nation, to our to our world, and also, um, you know, just how much we still have to give and mm -hmm. uh, how much there still is to learn. And so that's one of my motivating factors, I think, uh, is wanting to be a representative in Indian country to show people, you know, the kind of talent that we have, the, the kind of love that we have for each other. And, uh, you know, just try and make the world a better place that way. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd say you're well on your way to doing it. I mean, I think when you, as I mentioned, you know, there's, there are all these really great articles that I'll have linked to on the, on the podcast webpage so people can read further. But one of the, one of the things that I just thought you did such a great job with you and your team was the, the film about the crazy mountains. And I, I wish I could try to pronounce the name, but even with the Southern <laughs> accent, I'm going to, I'm going to mess it up. <laughs> Could you, could you maybe talk, first of all, talk a little bit about the Crazy Mountains and their place yeah. in, in your culture, and then we can get into the film, because I, I think the Crazy Mountains are some of the most beautiful mountains I've ever seen. And I've, I haven't been deep back up in there, but I used to spend a lot of time kind of driving around them, and I, they, they really do seem to almost have this a magical quality to them when you're looking at them from any season, looking, looking at them. So could you talk about the Crazies a little bit? Yeah, what a mystical mountain range, huh? They really are special. I think there are several things that made them special, just geographically speaking. You know, that they, uh, their proximity to the Absarica Beartooth Range, how they lie north of the Yellowstone and east of the Bridgers and south of the, uh, the Castles and Little Belts. And then to the east, you just have this expansive grass range that mm -hmm. uh, the bison would migrate through. And so just where they're at and how they fit into that puzzle on the land makes them absolutely extraordinary and singular, really. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's no other place like them. And so, uh, you know, there's that. And then there's the cultural history that, uh, again, Native people have been showing reverence to that place for, for so long. And, um, you know, when I was growing up, uh, I went to the Crow Agency School there uh, that's still there in Crow Agency. And as you walk through the door, there's a photo of the Chief Plenty Coos. And I, so I grew up with that, looking at that guy's face, you know, mm -hmm. um, but the photo was taken when he was probably in his 70s. So he was an older man by then. But I always knew who he was and um, knew his life story. And the story was when he was nine years old, he fasted on Crazy Peak you know, for four days with no food or water. And at the end of the four days, he still hadn't had his dream yet. So he cut off the tip of his uh, index finger on his left hand so that he would finally have his uh, vision. Mm -hmm. And um, understanding that all of that took place in the crazy mountains, that this little boy um, was able to do that. And the dream that he brought back and the significance of the dream, um, you know, I just was always just uh, entranced by him, wondering why would he do that? And, and of course, knowing that he wasn't the first person to have done that and that for many hundreds of years, people had been going there to go without food and water, to climb up on the highest peaks to, um, to get the kind of medicine that they needed to, to live the, their best life, I mm -hmm. guess you could say. And so, uh, you know, later on, my uncle fasted there and, uh, told me about the experience and made me want to go. And so I ended up fasting there and, uh, you know, have continued to engage with them and uh, tried to protect them and sharing my experience with my loved ones and with people back home and just really hoping that, you know, and I understand that people will continue from, from Crow to go there to seek medicine. And so it's just a real... Uh, sacred place. 
before we talk about the film, if if you feel comfortable, and if not, I can I can easily cut this out. But can you talk about your experience fasting up there and how that how that affected you? Oh yeah, sure. Oh, it was a profound experience. Um, I think anywhere you fast is going to be, or any time you do it, it's going to be profound, uh, and it's going to be very difficult. Um, if you haven't done it before, and even when you have done it before, it's it's never easy. Um, but when you're in a place like the Crazy Mountains, uh, there's such a feeling of, uh, I guess, kinship with the spirits on the land, with the animals, and with the knowledge that this is the church that people have been going to for hundreds of years, and that, um, you know, you're just following in their footsteps. Mm-hmm. Um it, it was a profound experience for me to to dig deep, to sacrifice, um, to go through those processes that people before me had gone through and to want to learn more about myself and about the mountains. And, you know, uh, I think did a lot of thinking and um, praying. And one of the things that occurred to me, you know, there's only three things that you can learn about in life. Um what's inside you, what's outside of you, and how those two things are supposed to be interacting. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if you boil it down to that, you know, the fast becomes a pretty, pretty uh, significant experience to gain those kinds of perspectives that will really shape the rest of your life, Um, you know, uh, to get you on a path as they say, and, you know, the, the destination, you know, um, you know, we're all going to die before we reach it. Uh, It's not, that's not the point, you know, Um, the point is to be on that path and to be walking in that way and to be making that medicine. Um, You know, it's not, it's an active verb, you know, it's an action. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we don't stop and, and say, now we're all done, you know, because that's just silly. You know, I mean, why would we do that anyway? Um, you know, life always continues on. And I think that understanding that uh, you gain that kind of knowledge from being out there by yourself in, in the wild and, and uh, you know, coming to terms with your weaknesses and your strengths and um, celebrating all those things and the opportunity that you have to, to suffer and sacrifice in a way that's going to, um, you know, make you more pure. How often do you try to do some sort of ceremony or, or event like, and like that? I mean, is it, is it an annual thing for you, whether it's that or a, a sweat lodge or, or something else? I mean, is there, do you try to do something like that on a, on a fairly regular basis or is it the kind of thing where you can do it every five, ten years, and that, that gets you, you know, that, that is powerful mm-hmm. enough to kind of get you on a path for, for a pretty extended period of time? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, um, for me, it's every day. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, every day I'm trying to be on that path, uh, just tr- trying to stay on the red road. Um, and I've learned that through trials and tribulations, you know, um, that there's no need to, like, Start walking on a different road and then um, remember where you're at and then try and go back onto that path again when you need to be there. I mean, I, I just felt like I just need to be in a I live. I need to live a ceremonial way of life. I just, you know, that's that's the best ro- road for me. And so whether I'm in the crazy mountains or it doesn't really matter where I'm at, you know, I just try to take those values and try and you know, integrate them into each thing that I do every day. Um, You know, the foods that I eat, uh, the way I speak to people, the way I interact with my children, you know, how I take care of myself, I'll take care of my body, you know, how I, uh, you know, think about, you know, the spirits uh, in myself and and around that we can't see, Um, you know, trying to be in tune with that. And also, you know, just the daily nitty gritty of life, you know, um, trying to do the work that I'm getting paid to do in a way that is, you know, authentic and reflects the best of me. Mm -hmm. Um, And all those decisions, I I feel like, you know, the multitude of choices and decisions a person has to make every day. um, When you're on that path of 
you know, trying to trying to be the best you can be, then I think things kind of fall together. But, you know, uh, a lot of people, everybody's different. Um, and I've kind of had to take this approach because this is the way that works for my life right now. Sure. And, you know, I don't have time to have the sweat lodge like I used to. Um, I just, you know, my life's busier now. Um, and going out and fasting in the mountains, that's great. But I don't have time really to do that the way I used to. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I feel like, you know, things have changed for me in some ways. But in other ways, uh, they're still just the same. And so uh, I think it's part of as we grow older and the different responsibilities that we have and trying to balance and find uh, the right path is, is always an ongoing thing. Are there any specific books or films or resources or, or individuals you've learned from, I mean, outside of your family, I guess, that it, say somebody who's listening to this that says, that sounds great. I want to live a life more like that, you know, a, what, what books or resources could you direct them to that have helped you as you've kind of figured out what this system that works well for you and allows you to really live life to the fullest? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, we're such an oral tradition, Ed. Um, mm-hmm. It's hard to really say that there's a book that has had the biggest influence on me. But there's been many Native authors that have tried to write about the wisdom of Northern Plains culture over the years. You know, Black Elk Speaks. He didn't actually write that book. That was John Nyhart that wrote that. But there's some great lessons in there. Um, contemporary books. Um Thinking about Joe Medicine Crow's book, uh, he's from our tribe. He was a great leader to me. Um, Counting Coup was one of his books that he wrote. It was great. Um, Alma Snell, uh, another great Crow historian and um, just very knowledgeable cultural person. She wrote a book called Grandmother's Grandchild. Okay. And that's wonderful read. And then she also wrote another one called A Taste of Heritage, where she talks about... Um, you know, native plant uses and uh, different recipes in there that Crow Indians had. Um, and I think within all of that is a wisdom that comes really come through, that comes shining through their voices, their personalities, their values. These are just world class human beings, you know, mm-hmm. they, they're, they got good spirits about them. They, they stay positive. They love their life. They want to share. They want to engage every day and, Maybe they're not telling you directly these are the things that you have to do every day, but what they're doing is they're they're modeling for you um, how to be yourself. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, trying to be a Native American in the 21st century, uh, it's, it's not an easy question to answer. Sure. You know, like what am I supposed to be doing? Like what clothes am I supposed to be wearing? Should I be wearing buckskin? You know, should I grow my hair long? Like. And what are what are the things I'm supposed to be doing? And I get this a lot. I've had that question asked of me. And usually it's within the context of how do I raise my children? You know, mm-hmm. like, Shane, are you teaching your kids to be Indian or whatever? And I, you know, I don't really know how to answer that other than to say that no one ever showed me how to be an Indian or taught me. They just were. And I just tried to be like them, you know, and... You know, uh, I think part of being Plains Indian is that we have such a pure oral tradition that we don't really have any teachings that we impress on our young people. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, we don't have a Koran. We don't have a Bible. We don't have, you know, Confucius or the Tao or, you know, there's nothing that we refer to. Sure. Um, And so for books... Uh, I think the best way to do it is just to read books by native elders and see what kind of wisdom you can gain from them. And I think there's an opportunity there. You need to write a book. <laughs> well, I have been actually. Have you really? <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Uh, for, I can't imagine anything harder than writing a book. I, I have a dream of oh, doing that, God. but it's just like, <laughs> I feel like I could, uh, there, there's some running race I want to do called the hard rock 100. I'm like, I could do that five or six times and it'd be easier than writing a book. <laughs> <laughs> So how can oh, you talk so about true. it? Can you talk about the book? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
So the title of my book is uh, Messages from Medicine Wheel Country. Uh, I've been working on it for several years. Um, you know, I'm always adding to it. Um, and really, I think earlier I was speaking, and I think the phone might have cut it out, but I was talking about how the more I learned about history and culture through books mm-hmm. uh, about Montana, the more questions I had than answers. Mm. And so one of the things I wanted to do was really investigate that white spot on the map. Um, what is it that's not being written about? Um, and how can I learn more about that? And so that's kind of what my book is about. And so if I could, in a nutshell, uh, give you the messages from Medicine Wheel Country. Um, so for 12,000 years, people have been here. And I know that because I was involved with the the repatriation of a 12,600-year-old Native American boy that was found not far from Bozeman mm-hmm. uh, along the Yellowstone River. And so in all that time that people lived here, uh, they were able to create a really balanced and stable culture that stretched across the tribes. So you had many different tribes that lived here in the northern plains in Montana, and they all got along for thousands of years so well, in fact, that they created their own language, a sign language. Wow. That has never been replicated anywhere in the world, and now it's never going to be replicated ever again, uh, unless we meet some Klingons, you know, along the <laughs> outer edges of the solar system, and we have to <laughs> develop a new language, right? Um, but you know, you think about how the sign language was developed over many generations, and it was not a product of. Uh, hearing impairment. I mean, it was not designed to communicate with folks who couldn't hear. It was totally designed to engage with people who spoke a different language than you. And so uh, everyone here on the Northern Plains was bilingual. They could speak sign language and they could speak their own, you know, uh, linguistic language, uh, uh, verbal language. Yeah. And uh, that made me uh, I, I came to the conclusion that the only way a language like that could be created and then held on to for so many generations is if they had stable trade relationships uh, that they engaged in every year. Mm-hmm. And then the, uh, the cultural artifacts that have come from that sign language in those trade relationships uh, are reflected in ceremonies like the sun dance, uh, the sweat lodge. Uh, the songs that we sing, the mm-hmm. star stories, how all of these different tribes, even though they speak completely different languages, have the exact same stories about the stars. Um, there, there was just a deep connection here on the Northern Plains. I don't think everyone, anyone's ever really written about it or been able to um, provide some insight on that. And so that's one of the goals of my book. Wow, I can't wait to uh, to read it when and no no pressure. I'm not trying to put pressure on you, but when it's <laughs> when it's done, uh, when it's done, you come back on and we'll we'll talk in detail oh, about yeah. it because that that yeah. really sounds it sounds interesting and it sounds like there's a real um, a need for that book to be written. So I I can't thank wait. Um, mm, thank you so much. What so to go back to the crazy mountains real quick? I want I do want to touch on the film and I'll I'll embed that in the webpage so people can watch it. Can you talk about the film and kind of why you guys decided there was a need to to make the film that you did? Absolutely. Yeah, we wanted to make a film about the Crazy Mountains because they are a really vulnerable place right now. Um, well, they have been since, since they were kind of uh, checkerboarded at the very beginning mm-hmm. when the, the land was privatized and the U.S. government gave a lot of that land to uh, the railroad um, as it was trying to make its way through Montana. And then, the, you know, from that point on, uh, the mountains just became really divided up between private and public lands, um, all interspersed and mixed in. They're, they're a remarkable geographic feature. They are uh, like one great big rock, you know, like 30 miles long and, you know, 12 miles wide and they've been carved up by glaciers 
you know, over the years. And they're very, what you get is this incredible mixture of steep terrain. Um, some of it heavily timbered, but uh, most of it just really uh, rocky, um, rough, with mm -hmm. lots of scree towards the peaks. And so they're not the, the type of mountain range where you see a lot of uh, herds of animals go into. They're just this really... They're a scenic mountain range that a lot of people want to have a piece of and mm -hmm. can have a piece of because, again, they've been divided up so much. So right now what we're seeing in the crazy mountains is there are many billionaires. Uh, you wouldn't believe it, actually, how many billionaires have land there and are continuing to buy land there. And the, the potential for them to be uh, developed uh, for little communities to, to pop up in there um, is pretty high right now, I think. And so we're doing what we can to protect them from that, uh, to preserve them, to keep their integrity. You know, there are many other mountain ranges in Montana where we see developments come up. Um, and, you know, I think that we should, you know, stick with what we've already been doing. But in terms of places that have been, you know, for the most part, non-developed uh, I think we should try and leave them as they are because once they begin once they get going on that path uh, it's pretty difficult to pull it back rein it back in and especially with the kind of wealth and power that we're seeing coming into the crazy mountains the potential for uh, hell attack or uh, helicopter skiing I can't remember what they call it yep um, and all these other different extreme sports and um Cabins being built way up high in the high country where helicopters can drop people off. Um, a lot of us that have enjoyed the crazy mountains and see them as a place of great uh, tranquility, um, even though the interstate's not that far, you're, you feel like you're really isolated up in there. Uh, we want to maintain that. And mm -hmm. so that's one of the reasons why we made the film. And so for people listening to this who watch the film and would like to maybe try to influence people to do the right thing on that, I mean, what, what would you recommend to, to people listening, um, how they could get involved with this or, or contribute or, or help with, with your efforts? Oh, that's a great question. You know, um, when we made the film, we were asking people to make comments to the public comment period during the time that the Forest Service was uh, creating a 30-year management plan. Mm -hmm. And so that now that that window is over, we're asking people to still you know, pay attention to what's happening there. We still have projects uh, underway. Um, I don't want to – I can't speak too much about what I'm doing right now because uh, – um, the kind of work that I'm doing with the partners that I have, we're trying to um, – I guess, move slowly. and uh, But we do have big plans for the Crazy Mountains. And for those folks that are listening right now, if you want to help protect them, um, stay tuned because uh, very soon this year, we're going to uh, come out with some uh, potential strategies to do that. And then we'll have some opportunities for them to contribute. That's great. And and as we talked about on the phone last week or whenever we, we chatted, you know, when when you're ready to announce that, um, mm. you just, just let me know and you come back on here and we'll, we'll blast it out. So I think that'll be, uh, however I can, however I can help with this little surprisingly, uh, this, this surprising platform I've built, <laughs> I'm more than happy to, to be your megaphone. So just, I work for you when it comes to that. So you just tell me when you want to come oh, back on. Um, thank you. One other thing I want to um, ask you about is your business, uh, Native Nexus, because I think yeah. that's that's so interesting, and I think it's um, uh, uh, you're providing once again a, a much needed service that um, helps lots and lots and lots of people. So, can you talk about your business and how that came to be and what you do? Yeah, sure. You know, Native Nexus. Um, that name there came from my cousin back home. Uh, he kind of gave that to me. And um, so I thought, wow, this is a cool name. I like it. <laughs> and so I, start, I started using it when 
Montana's Indian Education for All law was funded back in 2005. Mm -hmm. And so um, we have a unique law in the state of Montana that all public schools have to teach about the unique and distinct heritage and culture of American Indians. Mm -hmm. And that was actually written into our constitution in 1972. And then it was codified into our laws in 1999, uh, but it wasn't actually funded until 2005. And so when it was funded, uh, the whole goal was to create curriculum for public schools, for teachers to use, because at, up to that point, we hadn't had anything to teach people about American Indians in Montana. And so that's how Native Nexus really kind of became active in Indian education. And, uh, you know, at the time I formed a, the company with my wife and uh, one of my good friends from graduate school. Um, And then over time, uh, I just started doing a bunch of other different things, kind of more out on my own. And, you know, I do all kinds of things. And, um, you know, just this past weekend, we completed an opera uh, about climate change. And I was able to integrate, I I helped produce and perform in the opera. And that was held on the Arthur Blank's West Creek Ranch over in the Paradise Valley, they hosted the whole thing and uh, just amazing, gracious, generous hosts. Uh, they allowed us to use their landscape. And so we had a set uh, that moved around. The audience had to move around to six different points um, uh, along the ranch, down by the river through the cottonwood groves. And uh, it was at night and we had lighting and uh, mirrors and sound and um, gave people really a singular experience down there along the river. I was able to, um, uh, I did a monologue based on Old Man Coyote's creation story and talked about, gave a brief history of the Paradise Valley. That was one of the scenes. And so this is the kind of work that I really love doing and having my own company and my own consultant business uh, gives me the opportunity, the freedom, I guess, Mm -hmm. to do those kinds of things and you know we've been doing that with mountain time arts for the past six years and um and next year on tap we have some performances that we're going to do in the yellowstone park oh so we're going to be doing three yeah yeah and it's going to be a first it'll be the first time it's ever happened um and we're going to be doing three to five live performance art pieces in the yellowstone park next summer to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the park and also to uh, continue the discussion and dialogue around a permanent teepee village in the park, which is, uh, I think is going to become a reality. Man, that is really, really cool. So like when you, you've got so many different things coming on, coming uh, up, like net, you know, the, the Yellowstone thing you just mentioned, and you've got so many different projects that you're always working on. I mean, where do you see your career going over the next, 10, 20 years, because it just seems like it's evolving so quickly and you've got your hands in so many different, interesting and important subject matters. So like, where do you, when you think about yourself as you, know, <laughs> you plus 20 years from now, I mean, what, what would you ideally want to be doing? You asked some great questions. Uh, I can see why your show is popular. They're very <laughs> insightful. <and> that. <laughs> I hope they're not weird. Sometimes I like these people are going to think I'm stalking them. <laughs> Oh, no, not at all. You know, I'm not sure, Ed, I guess is the answer. Um, one of the things that's becoming more, it seems like uh, one thing that's really kind of blowing up for me right now is film. So I'm involved with several film projects. Um, I've actually got a National Geographic project I'm just getting started here with, on, and that's on the Yellowstone Park. Um, and then we also have several independent film projects that we have. That we just finished sizzle reels on, and we're getting... We're pitching them out now to Amazon Prime and uh, Apple TV. And I think that I uh, more than likely some of them are going to get picked up. And I can't, you know, I've kind of signed some non-disclosure agreements on what those are. But um, they're pretty cool concepts. And I think that more than likely Ed, um, they're going to come through. And hopefully we can continue. I can continue to make film. I really love making films. I enjoy i feel comfortable on camera and i've been doing it long enough now i have enough experience that um you know it's 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 good i'm getting better at it mm-hmm. and so uh that's i think that's probably likely one of the things that's going to happen to me in the 20 in the next 20 years i suppose 
No, that's, I, I think that's great. And, you know, when you read about Netflix and Apple TV and all these different streaming platforms and how much money they're willing to invest in different projects that, you know, when we were, when we were kids, there were three channels and that's it. Yeah, and, exactly. and, and now there's just this opportunity. It's kind of the same as with podcasts is that there's these opportunities to, to yeah. find your audience, no matter how niche your subject is. And so I, that's, that's really exciting. And the, the great thing about that too, is that there's, there's money to be made doing it, which makes it sustainable. And, um, yeah. Well, I can't wait yep. to hear more about that. We're, we're definitely teeing up uh, Shane Doyle part two on the podcast because we got a lot to talk about <laughs> as I all this know, stuff comes together. Started. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing I was going to say is people are always asking me to go into politics. And, um, you know, just this weekend, uh, someone was talking about it, you know, over at we, when we finished up the opera and asking me what my next political uh, – office that i was going to be running for i was like oh my god do you think you would you have any interest in that well i've always been drawn to it and you know my family has a rich history of politics Uh, my great grandfather uh, my grandmother was passionate about politics my uncle was the very first county commissioner ever uh indian county american indian county commissioner in bighorn county and he remained in that position for 35 years and so um yeah, I mean, I, I've i always been interested in it, and I've always been around it, and so I've always paid attention, and you know, I've always felt like, you know, maybe that might be the niche for me, but um, I've got so many other interests as well that it's hard for me to just focus on one thing, and I kind of have a feeling that that's what I would have to do, and so... I don't know with the five children and um, with the life my wife lives as well. <laughs> I might have to wait a little bit on that. Well, I think they'd be uh, everybody be lucky to have you if you chose to do that. It, the thing about politics these days is it just seems like a lot of the people that I would love to see in leadership positions they're rightly so they say man i don't want to get involved in that fight um but if you can you know you can channel your your grandmother's toughness and refusing to to bend and and bring in that i mean i think that i think you would do awesome so um man we'll see we'll see who knows (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) um well i've got i've got a few questions that i like to ask people uh towards the end of the interviews and so i was wondering if we could run through those real quick if you don't mind yep what are your favorite, you've already mentioned a few great books, um, but, but do you have any kind of overall favorite books? And they, I, I usually ask if they're about the American West, but I mean, they don't have to be about the West, just books that have been impactful for your life and your career and has kind of shaped you into the person you are today. Absolutely. Um, there have been some really important books about the West, actually. I might as well focus on that. Yeah. Uh, one of the books that really just oh my God, kind of blew me away was uh, The History of the Crow Tribe. Uh, And it was published, I believe, in 1995. Um, And it's called Parading Through History, The Making of the Crow Nation in America, uh, 1805 to 1934. Okay. And the author is Frederick Hoxie. And it won a book award. Um, It just really, really gave me a passion to want to do something like that. Uh, There was so much information in that book that I didn't know about. And um, I was just blown away by the sophistication of the approach that this scholar took to the Crow Nation, the Crow people, putting them in the kind of context that I hadn't seen before. Um, And so that was, you know, impactful, uh, to say the least. And then another one of my favorite authors who's written about the West a lot, uh, and ironically, his name is Elliot West. Hmm. And uh, a couple of the books that he wrote, one of them is called The Contested Plains. Um, And that's really important. You know, that talks about the Colorado Gold Rush. I think you should read that if you get an opportunity. Okay, I will. It's mostly all about Colorado. Yeah, yeah. And he's really funny, too. He talks about how people in Colorado talk about the Colorado Gold Rush. (laughs) Um, and, uh, you know, he really makes fun of it and it's hilarious. Okay. I'll, I'll definitely, uh, and he's read actually from Arkansas. Yeah. So you would probably really kind of have a kindred spirit in him and he's brilliant. He is just a thoughtful. Well, that's where we're um, not. We don't have anything in common. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he's got a great sense of humor, just like you, right? Okay. So, and he's a Southern 
Colorado. <laughs> nice. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So I highly recommend that. And then from native authors, you know, as I mentioned before, Joe Medicine Crow is a great one. Uh, you know, he's written a couple of books. Counting Coup was one of them. Uh, from the Heart of Crow Country is another one. Um, he's passed away. You know, he lived to be 102 years old. Wow. And he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from Barack Obama. Um, yeah, he had served in World War II and uh, counted coup and was like one of the considered to be one of the last people in the tribe to to really be uh, a chief, even though he wasn't really given never th- that full title. Mm-hmm. Um, he certainly could have been. And so I always encourage people to read his stuff. And then, as I said, Alma Snell, um, another one, uh, uh, Dear Knows. Oh, gosh, what's her name? Agnes. Uh, and there's a book called They Call Me Agnes. Okay. And uh, that, that's a great book for her. I always try to include women as well because a lot of times, of course, in Western history, their voices are not, not heard as that much. And so, um, yeah, the, the, those are some that come to mind. Those are awesome. And, and most of those are new to me, um, which is exactly one of the reasons I love having these conversations, because I'm, I'm always trying to find new books to read, new perspectives. So I'll have links to all those for people to click through oh, and, and get them. Um, as far as films, you know, with your, your interest in film and this you know, potential for your career to, to go pretty deep into films. Who, what are some films that you have found um, inspiring or important kind of in your life and career? And they don't have to be related to the West, really. Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, <laughs> the, the one that I think still influences me and influences so many Native people is that was made 50 years ago. Uh, Little Big Man, uh, Dustin Hoffman, mm-hmm. the Arthur Penn show. Uh, you know, that one there, the Josie Wales, the outlaw Josie Wales, uh, yep. Clint Eastwood, but the performance by Chief Dan George, which really highlighted, you know, for those of us on the reservation, that film. And uh, yeah, I mean, those, the classics, I think, have always influenced me, the classic fiction films, even though they probably don't give an accurate representation of Native people, but the humor um, has always been right in, in, you know, the wheelhouse for native people lately. Uh, there's been some great stuff that's been out on like Netflix and, um, and uh, I think Amazon prime, I think it was uh, reservation dogs, uh, Taiki Waititi, the, uh, Maori, New Zealand Maori writer. Um, he's done this little season one. I think there's only been two episodes out so far. And I've really enjoyed it. It's been really raw. I would, certainly the language is not suitable for young children, probably. But um, it's it's a new take on the reservation experience today. And it's really unfiltered and powerful and funny and heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I would highly recommend Reservation Dogs. Um, and then, you know, as far as fiction films that have influenced me by way of disappointment, I would say one of them is The Reverend. Um, you know, when I are The Revenant. Oh, yeah, with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio? Yeah, with Leo DiCaprio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I live in the place where that movie was supposedly have to have happened, right? Around the headwaters of the Missouri River is where this whole bear incident happened with um, Hugh Glass. And he was supposed to have walked down the Missouri, you know, and all that, and made his way to the fort and survived. And none of that film was shown in a topography or geography like the one I live in. And so from the very beginning of the film, I was like, oh, man, this is not accurate. Mm-hmm. You know, this this is a Hollywood depiction. It has to be deep in the mountains. And the three forks of the Missouri are out here on the plains, you know? Yeah, I remember and, that. There was like a the, the scene I remember – there are two things I remember from that movie. One was some scene where they're in a swamp and it looked like they were in Louisiana or something. And then the other was, it's just Leonardo <laughs> DiCaprio, like screaming in pain for two and a half hours. Like that, that's my, that's my memory of that movie. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. Yeah, it, it, it's a shame. Yeah. And I see Scorsese's coming out with killers of the flower moon. I'm, I'm really excited. Oh, really? And yeah. Yeah. Uh, DiCaprio of course is going to be in that. Uh, but there's also some native people who, and that's being filmed 
uh, on the Osage Indian Reservation, I think, where the actual story occurred. I don't know if you're familiar with the story or have heard of the book. Yeah, I've read it. It was great. Oh, cool. Yeah, awesome. So there's that to look forward to. But my dream, as I said, about, uh, you know, kind of the theories about my book and the concepts about my book, I want to make the old time native film out here on the northern plains uh, of native people walking around, you know, pre pre uh, horse era. Uh-huh. Um, what was going on then? You know, what did things look like? Um, you know, that's one of my dreams. And then also to do a new to do a reboot of the Little Bighorn Battle, to do a uh, another film on that, but way more historically accurate. And uh, we could, you know, I've thought about this a lot because I've done films on Little Bighorn before, uh, like with the History Channel. And I've talked about it for years and read about it. And I lived there and my stepdad and his brothers put on the reenactment every year, the Little Bighorn reenactment. And so, I mean, and I've talked about it with friends for years uh, about the film that we could do on that. And so that's another one I'd like to do. What's the best book on that battle? Because there's like four or five of them that I have written down <laughs> that I want to read, but I haven't, I've never read a book about that specifically. Is there one that you recommend? Well, you know, the one that I've read, it's, it's kind of old, um, but I, I've sure liked it. Is the author is James Welch, and it's called Killing Custer. Okay, and that might be one of the few books written about the battle from the native perspective. Uh, there's also Soldiers Falling Into Camp, and my uncle helped write that, Frederick Left Hand, and that's a, a all Native American oral tradition history of the battle. Um, and then um, there's some other good ones that have come out. The Last Stand. Yeah, um, I've I've seen that one. I think I got it at the library one time, but I never I didn't read it. Um, I just there's so many, and I, I if I read it, I don't want to I don't want to read ten books about it. I want to read one that can kind of give me the <laughs> get give me the, uh, the the right story. So that's that's perfect. I'll have links to those. Um, well, that's those are all great. Um, so kind of last big question, um, you know, the people who listen to this podcast, they, they love the West in one way, they, yep. one way or another through, whether it's through history or through conservation or athletics or, you know, agriculture, just yep. people that feel connection to this landscape. Um, and so if you had some kind of parting words of wisdom to offer to these folks, anything come to mind? Help protect the West. I, I, you know, we all have our own role to play. You know, we all have our own niche to fill. We all have our own web that we're connected to. We all have our own insights and our own knowledge about what we can do to help protect this place that we love so much. And I think, you know, reflecting back for thousands of years, you know, the Plains Indians that lived here that walked around for thousands of years here, they had to move camp seasonally. So they, they would go from the river valleys in the winter where, you know, they had shelter from the wind and they had water to drink and wood to burn and, you know, a, a niche there. And then when the when the springs come and the floods come and the mosquitoes come back and the grizzly bears are awake and, you know, it, it gets busy down by the river, they would move and they would go up onto the higher, drier grounds and they would trade and, uh, you know, dig for roots and you know, that lifestyle was very ceremonial. It was very fulfilling. I think it was beautiful for them. And um, But one of the things, Ed, is that, you know, they didn't have very many material possessions. So they didn't have a lot of material wealth, but they had great spiritual wealth mm-hmm. uh, that far surpassed people around the world. And I would like to encourage our listeners to remember that lesson, because when you come here to the West, you know, we're coming here not for material wealth. We're coming here for something far more valuable than that, something that, you know, can't be bought or sold, uh, something that is either there or it's not. And, you know, once it's gone, it's pretty hard to bring it back. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, keeping the animals around, keeping the water clean, keeping the air clean, keeping the the ground as intact as we as much as we possibly can. You know, we all have our own role to play in that. And I encourage all of us to take an active one. Because, uh, you know, like my grandma said, you know, if you're not standing up for something, then you're going to fall for anything. And uh, I think that we need to stand up for the West. 
I think that is a perfect way to end it. Um, Shane, it's, it's a real, real, real pleasure getting to know you. And I look forward to continuing the conversation and, you know, open invite for you to come back on whenever, whenever you want. And, um, I hope we can meet in person one of these days, but thanks for everything you're doing, man. It, it's really, really important stuff. Oh God. Thank you, Ed. You're the man. I, I can't wait to talk to you again. And I hope we can come to Montana and we can go out for dinner and go down to the, to the river, up to the mountains. It'd be fun to hang out with you. Hey, it's Ed again. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast. I know your time is valuable, so it means the world that you spend it listening. If you want to support the podcast and help it to continue to spread and grow, there are a few ways you can help. Number one, pass it along to a friend or share it on social media. Word of mouth recommendations are the most powerful way for ideas to spread, so I'd love it if you could share the podcast with a few pals who might enjoy it. Number two, you can go to Apple Podcasts and give it a five-star review. Good reviews encourage the Apple overlords to suggest the podcast to others. So there's a link in the notes if you'd be so kind as to give it five stars. Number three, you can support the podcast financially via Patreon. And there are exclusive benefits for those who do, including a monthly behind-the-scenes newsletter, Mountain and Prairie stickers, live and recorded video chats with podcast guests, and much more. Number four, I've also got two emails that I send out. The first is my weekly email called Good News from the American West, which I send out every Wednesday. It's only positive news, something we can all use a little more of these days. And my other email is my bi-monthly book recommendations email. One email every other month with five, six, seven, or eight books that I've recently read and highly recommend. The thousands of people on both of these lists will vouch for me. No spam or other funny business. And number five, finally... Check out my online store for Mountain and Prairie stickers, shirts, and coffee mugs. I've got some really cool designs from Western artists with more on the way. So head to mountainandprairie.com slash shop to check it all out. I'd love to connect with you. I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn. So look me up on either of those platforms by my name or through the links on my website. All right, that's it. Thanks so much for your support. Uh-huh.